much um, for being here today. I hope you can hear us uh, both. And we're going to try a little bit of a double act um, and speaking with you about our experience of working with communities um, using remote sensing data, mobile devices, citizen science, really to help us to understand and engage with um, important and special landscapes um, in a number of different case uh, studies. Uh, we'll be looking at four different areas today, the Southlands National Park, the New Forest National Park, um, an area categorised as a forgotten landscape, which is a landscape scale partnership in South Gloucestershire and Bristol, and also the area around Mitchell Dever. Um, and really, when we talk about remote sensing, a lot of us think about automatically LIDAR data, I would imagine, these days. Um, but actually, there's a whole plethora of different um, techniques, aerial photography, um, geophysical techniques, non-invasive survey, um, and we have got ex um, a, a good background in, sorry. Oh, okay. Just pick you up now. Fabulous, thank you. Um, so uh, we have been using these uh, technologies and engaging communities and understanding how to use these technologies for, um, their, uh, for understanding and engagement with the historic uh, environment for a good number of years. Um, we all know the kind of origins of where these techniques began in terms of a, a professional story, and there's no doubt that they've really changed the way that we perceive landscapes. If you look back at sort of aerial photography, we've had over 100 years of using aerial photographs to understand landscapes. LiDAR data is a little bit more of a newcomer, but we've still been using that routinely since the mid-2000s. Um, and really, it's the advent of the Environment Agency Open Data, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with. Um, back in 2016, the release of the DTM and DSM, so that's surface models and terrain models, alongside their point cloud data, so the raw data. Now, that data covers about 60% of uh, the UK, at one, uh, of England, sorry, at one metre resolution. It's a phenomenal resource. However, just because it's free doesn't necessarily mean it's easy to use, either by professionals or by our community volunteers. And so today we'll look at a couple of examples where we have been able, specifically, um, looking around that sort of complicated area of LiDAR data and how we can incorporate into that research but into our community involvement with the landscapes. Uh, so the first uh, project I'd like to talk about is the Secrets of the High Woods. Has anybody heard about this uh, particular project before? There's a couple of nods, a couple of waves. Brilliant, that's really, really good. So this is a project that I was involved in for the first couple of years, um, and it involved surveying 315 square kilometres of uh, historic woodland in the South Downs National Park. So it's an area that stretches between um, uh, the River Arran and the uh, A350. And it's an area where... It was suspected or it was known from um, uh, various kind of limited ground surveys that there was an awful lot of extant archaeological um, remains and features within the landscape. However, due to the type of vegetation and the difficulties of uh, non-permissive access within the area, it was impossible to put a, um, a landscape perspective over what was known um, for this region. So we were fortunate enough to get HLF fund um, funding to do a heritage project. Um, and. Uh, collected 0.25 metre resolution data um, for this in 2013-14. Alongside that project, we were able to um, commission a national mapping programme transcription. So importantly, we had that um, professional baseline understanding of, of, the, of the data that we collected alongside all the other usual um, suspects that the NMP look at in terms of historic environments and, and map information. And we engaged the local community as field survey uh, team members. So it was really, in this instance, about uh, training people up to work within the woodlands to understand the, the quality and the quantity of data and to add that next level to our remote sensing um, project. Very often you'll find that when people look at LiDAR data, um, if they have uh, the advantage of being able to first of all acquire it for themselves and then have a project to be able to look at it and analyse it, it typically goes not much further than a desk-based assessment. And so what we were able to do and what we were pleased to be able to do as part of this project was incorporate community volunteering into taking us a step further to field verification and thus a greater understanding of actually what is being presented within this data and how it's being conserved, preserved and how it can be managed in, in the future. Very briefly, the results, um, a few things that you'd probably expect and a few additional items as well. So there are a series of professional reports produced, including the National Mapping Report, um, 
Each of the field surveys, uh, a report was produced uh, in collaboration with the volunteer archaeologists. They were co-authors to each of those reports, knowing their patch, understanding their area. Um, they brought an awful lot to that. Uh, there's an interactive map that's just been launched online so people can view the data and the field sites. Hopefully you can see that there in the, in the bottom left of the screen. The field information that was also collected as part of that. Um, there were, and in terms of the actual sort of numbers of sites, the quantity of information, well, there was a 72% increase in sites. And that's, if you've worked with LIDAR data in woodland areas, you won't be entirely surprised that that was... Um, that, that was the outcome. It really is the only technique to look at landscape in this kind of uh, detail. Uh, so it's unsurprising we've got so much additional information um, through that. But it wasn't just about engaging people with that sort of that single archaeological task, so to speak. What we wanted to be able to do was engage a broader section of the public, either actively or passively, um, for want of a better term, with the heritage of that area. So, for example, we also ran a parallel archival research project and an oral history project that engaged people with different aspects of the, um, the history and heritage of the woodlands. And the, uh, one of the outcomes was a travelling exhibition and uh, a virtual reality app that helped <coughs> engage people of all ages um, with the stories that were told as part of this project. So, I'm going to hand over to Lawrence. Thank you. So, similarly to the South Downs National Park, the New Forest um, has had a number of large-scale landscape um, projects where we've been using remote sensing to record, monitor and manage archaeological sites. Um, the New Forest itself, located on the south coast, is the smallest national park. And what, but what is incredible is, this, considering its size, we have a hugely diverse landscape and that ranges from... Um, Lowland heathlands, one of the largest lowland heathlands in Europe, or coverage lowland heathlands in Europe, ancient woodlands, um, huge variety of geologies. And as a result, humans have shaped that landscape in uh, numerous different ways and utilised that landscape across um, thousands of years. Um, so through a variety of um, what's UK's largest high-level stewardship scheme, um, the Verda is the high-level stewardship scheme, um, funding through that, and three... Um, Heritage Lottery funding projects, which looks at rapid coastal zone assessment, New Forest Remembers, World War II projects, and we currently have a landscape partnership scheme, uh, which is um, uh, looking at woodland enclosures. Um, we've acquired blanket coverage of the, um, remote sensing data for the New Forest, so this sees 50 centimetre LIDAR data, aerial photography, near-infrared imagery, and more recently we've actually acquired a one metre resolution um, from 2016. So it's safe to say we're well covered and we've got a huge amount of data. Um, a bit of background as well, that, that uniqueness of the landscape and the creation of the New Forest in 1079 by William the Conqueror means that the archaeology in the New Forest is almost in a time capsule. It hasn't seen the traditional pressures that you might see, so there's not been much intensive farming, particularly on the open crown lands, and development because of the national park status and the royal hunting forest has meant there's been little encroachment. So any archaeological features that were created beforehand and that have been created since the, the creation of the royal forest have been preserved fairly well. That said, when, when the, new, the high level stewardship scheme started in 2010, there were only 1,000 archaeological sites recorded on the open forest, and that's an area of about 24,000 hectares. Um, and it was felt that that wasn't an accurate representation of what was out there, and we were concerned that archaeological sites might be damaged by forestry works that were taking place. We see wetland restorations, we see um, commercial forestry taking place, and um, a series of other, other um, uh, aspect, um, pressures that national parks see, uh, including recreational use as well. Um, so the, the provision and the acquisition of this remote sensing data has completely changed the way we're able to manage, manage the new forest. Um, it's dramatically increased our records. I think between the three projects, we're around 5,000 features and sites that have um, been recorded now. Um, and uh, it's helped us to engage with partner organisations. So the Forestry Commission, the National Trust, Natural England, Historic England, the Verderers, who are an ar <coughs> archaic management um, organisation that was set up by William the Conqueror and the official Verderer is appointed by the, the Queen. It, it's, 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 it's allowed us to work with them and really bring heritage to the foreground 
and actually let them see that there's stuff hidden beneath the trees, there's stuff out there, and it's important. And they've all embraced it and, and come together to work with it. As I say, it's a really easy sell for engagement, whether it's partner organisations or the general public. Um, we, much like South Downs, we utilise uh, mobile devices, tablet devices, to go out with groups of volunteers and ground verify all the features we identify in the data. So nothing goes into the records without being checked first. Um, and last year alone, we had over 400 volunteer days undertaken between the different projects. So it, it's it's engaging. It's that people like it, and it's a fantastic way of updating our our records and keeping our archaeology safe. Um, it's also an easy sell for the younger generations. We had a temporary exhibition where we highlighted five years of the high-level stewardship scheme and some of the features that have been found. We had 20,000 20, people visited the exhibition over four months. Um, we had a digital archaeology weekend where we utilised um, computer games, virtual uh, reality, tablet devices, Minecraft, um, and 400 people came, 800 people came along over two days. It was fantastic. Um, we've also utilised uh, national um, crowdsourcing um, platforms. So there's MicroPass website, which is UCL and Muse um, Museum of London, um, where they, or British Museum, where they crowdsource um, projects. And we, uh, through the Second World War project, we acquired a series of uh, prisoner of war newsletters that were all written in German. Um, so we actually uploaded these to the, uh, the website and all these newsletters have now been translated into English and we've, we've gained an insight into this prisoner of war uh, camp that's on the open forest. A lot of people don't like concrete on the open forest. There's a call to remove Second World War features in the new forest, um, but we're able to give tangible um, connections to this site now and protect it and ensure it, it survives for, uh, into the future. We've also engaged with other citizen science projects, so when we haven't got any work specifically in the summer when the ground nesting birds have arrived, we've had teams engaging in the Atlas of Hillforts um, project. And um, as a result, we've had volunteers receive awards, much like you saw with Bob's um, project um, from UK National Parks. Um, and another important part of our, our projects as a whole, we're currently developing the New Forest Knowledge, which is going to be a one-stop shop for all things heritage, uh, or, which could be natural or cultural. Um, all our records will be going up there, um, links to the Portable Antiquity Scheme, LiDAR images, oral histories, um, historic photos. It's going to be a fantastic resource and it's going to be a two-way conversation so people are going to be, up, be, able, be able to upload information, download information, edit and improve records. Um, and more recently, just a little nod, um, we received an award from Current Archaeology as an exemplary example of how LIDAR can be used um, in, in heritage in heritage management and archaeology. So that was very nice. Um, so we talked about the, uh, in some ways, the low-hanging fruit, and I'm sure people in this room would disagree with me um, with respect to that. Um, but there's a strong argument to say, if you're working within an existing designated landscape, particularly a national park, uh, the people within your communities probably already know something about how important that landscape is. They will have their own individual interests within that, but they will probably understand, to a certain extent, um, the natural and cultural significance of that landscape. The project that I'm currently working on uh, is a landscape scale partnership, and Fiona beautifully introduced these earlier on. Um, then this is a scheme by the, historic, uh, the, by the Heritage Lottery Fund um, to encourage communities to get more involved in their cultural and natural heritage outside designated landscapes. Now they can include designated landscapes, but this particular one, a forgotten landscape on the edge of the River Severn, doesn't include any landscapes that are designated for, for cultural heritage um, purposes. Um, if you're familiar with this area, you'll notice that uh, it's uh, quite a dynamic landscape. It's got the two bridges that cross the River Severn. There's been an awful lot of development within the last 60 years. The area alongside Bristol, the Avonmouth Port, um, is a huge enterprise zone, um, really important for the economy of Bristol. Uh, the area to the north is very much rural character, um, a rural farming landscape still. Um, but there's a perception within the communities of these areas that they're very much on the edge of what happens both within South Gloucestershire and within Bristol itself. They're, they are overlooked to some degree, um, both as communities but also as landscapes. 
As part of this project, we're doing a whole um, series of environmental and heritage projects, and that ranges from everything from bird watching um, alongside the European um, uh, sites along the River Edge uh, to uh, a specific archaeological project on a site in Old Beyond Seven to working with schools, uh, doing oral histories, uh, conservation and restoration of particular landscapes within uh, within the area. And really working holistically with our partners, as Fiona mentioned, is, is hugely important. But with respect to engaging um, the, the communities, what we've been really pleased to see is, is a huge response and a huge enthusiasm for the work that we're doing. Um, and we've been able to uh, adapt and flex to some extent our ideas of what the volunteers uh, could be involved in as this project has progressed. So we're working for three and a half years in this landscape and that gives us a little bit more flexibility unlike say a sort of a one shot one year um, project officer post. Uh, it gives us that opportunity to develop and to work with volunteers to find out what they want to do. So as a few examples, we've done quite a lot of geophysical survey of a particular site in, in Old Brion 7 as our, as our starting point. Now this is classified as a hill fort, um, it's actually a, more akin to a marsh fort as you can probably imagine sitting down there in the levels. Um, and beyond that very little is known about it, we've no secure dating, um, for example there's been no modern excavation. And So we trained and we worked with uh, a group of community volunteers to do resistance survey, magnetometry survey, a series of test pits which will lead towards um, a major excavation this summer which will be the first uh, really looking at this, uh, this monument in its landscape context. Um, but as a, as a slight aside from the sort of um, the typical way in which our volunteers would engage in that we, we would train them to work with us to understand a technique and to apply that technique, we would give them support, professional support in order to be able to do that, to analyse the results and, and work on from that. Uh, the two chaps on the left, uh, David and Jeff, along with Mary who's taking the picture, um, are uh, members of our geophysical survey team and they, in addition to do the, doing the sort of standard techniques, uh, took to hand our resistance tomography kit, uh, which uh, I don't quite know how it ended up in a cupboard in South Gloucestershire Council, if I'm perfectly honest, but it's there. And we wanted to use it, we really wanted to use it, both to understand the banks and ditches of this monument, but also to understand an area just to the south of it, where it appeared that there was a paleo channel feature um, possibly relating to access to that fort in the previous period. And what these brilliant people were able to do was to take the kit that we had and the resistance <coughs> that did not match that kit and be able to, to put it together using their electrical and engineering experience, make it work, produce data and get some phenomenal results. Um, and that's an example really of being able to provide, I suppose, a stretch activity, uh, something that our volunteers were really keen to do. We had a limited ability to be able to facilitate that, but we were able to use their skills and expertise to, to move things on in a way that they were really interested and engaged with. Another example of that kind of higher level, um, if, you, if you like, engagement with volunteers or, or high, high skill level engagement is a project that we started um, at the beginning of this year and this is really about um, capturing the data from um, LIDAR uh, survey within the area. Now unlike the High Woods project we didn't have a big pot of money to commission a brand new LIDAR survey which is uh, a shame but because we're out there on the river edge we've actually got quite a lot of coverage of environment agency data and Bristol City Council have got complete coverage of their patch too. Um, so what our volunteers have uh, uh, willingly put their hands up and said they want to do is to help us transcribe that data to understand the landscape and to record it in our historic environment record system. And we've been able to facilitate that, um, but it's not an easy task. This is a really big ask of our volunteers because you think breaking down all the things that you need to know to be able to understand an archaeological landscape, uh, to understand historic environment records, the terminology that we use, uh, then to be able to get to grips with um, LIDAR data, the different visualisations and how to appropriately use that and put it into GIS software so that you can have records that are born digital and appropriate to the standard that we expect, that, that's a really big task for them to undertake. And I think really the sort of take home message um, from, from this aspect for me is how willing they are and how engaged they are and how much they want to do this but also how much support, professional support is required to, to enable them to undertake these tasks and to work successfully and to feel that level of satisfaction um, that each and every one of our volunteers deserves to have if they're giving their time to work with our projects. So as well as, um, as engaging the public and volunteers and um, communities with the heritage, the remote sensing has also proved a really good way 
of engaging um, land managers with with their heritage and their archaeology. And this is just a very quick example of a site that I'm currently working with with the Forestry Commission. So the National Park currently provides a archaeology service level agreement for the central southern region for the Forestry Commission. So we advise them everywhere between Wareham, the South Downs, up to Surrey, on to the Isle of Wight, which is great because I get to leave the New Forest now and again. Um, but this is, this is a site near Winchester called Mitchell Dever, and it's a scheduled landscape but it's also a commercial uh, woodland. Um, and the foresters here want to protect their archaeology, want to look after their archaeology, but they don't quite understand it. And prior to looking at the uh, remote sensing data, there was a uh, Royal Commission survey that was done in the 19, uh, 1990s, but it wasn't on their GIS systems and they didn't quite understand what was going on. And it's your traditional woodland. You've got windblow, you've got uh, planting, you've got felling, you've got clay, um, clay subsoils that are being churned up by heavy machinery and you've got an archaeology trail which is great um, but what we've been able to do using the environment agency data is really pull out the features that are known um, as well as identify new features uh, so here you can see a banjo enclosure just down here along with a dike a number of um, extraction pits um, loads of stuff in there it's brilliant but um, what we get from the forest is, is a map like down here uh, with crosses saying where they're going to fell trees and it's not really that useful. So we can then provide them with online maps, online resources and they can plan their forestry works a lot easier and we're currently working with them to, write, to work out scheduled monument management plans for the whole of the south, central southern region as well. So it's really helping to inform this work we're doing with them. Um. So really to sort of start to conclude our experience, we've run through a few of our different projects here and we know we're relatively short on time. Um, but the question that we want to pose and the thing that we want to um, just talk about for the last few minutes is really what um, defines a good heritage project, a community heritage project in terms of how we use our technology. Now, there's a lot of technology out there. Lawrence and I could talk with you at great length and we hope that some of you will come and talk to us uh, later on about the various different options. And we've had some mentioned already. Um, but really the importance here is in understanding how that technology fits with the particular project and the roles and the tasks and importantly the volunteer um, demand and uh, needs within any given area. Technology can be a really good way of engaging new audiences and getting high quality um, recording and survey work with existing um, volunteers um, but it requires um, a, a lot of support and a lot of thinking about so really it's not so much the technology that's smart, um, these, te these uh, devices, the technology, the laptops we're using are, are every day now, they're commonplace. It's not the technology that's smart, but it's the project design that has to be. And what we have is expertise within our community to be able to help facilitate that. And I think that what we'd like to see a little bit more of is, is engaging um, with that sort of as a, as a discipline so that we can prevent making the same mistakes again, potentially. <coughs> At this stage, I just uh, I want to recognise, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, that volunteers really do want very different things very often when they come to you as part of their experience. And the more flexible that we can be and the more innovative in some respects we can be in terms of applying technology and tasks and incorporating their skills and their efforts, the better our projects will be and the better their experience will be. So it's to the good of everybody um, to be able to be flexible and adaptable um, and uh, to, to lead the sort of cutting edge sometimes when it comes to application of this technology. So this is um, actually something I'm, I'm showing for the first time. I'm currently doing a part-time PhD at University of Winchester looking at how we can utilise citizen science to manage protected landscapes and the heritage in those. And I just wanted to mention this, but all of us have one of these in our pockets these days. And what you can do is I can buy all your information from your mobile phone companies, which is petrifying, but also an amazing resource because I won't know your names, but I'll know your gender, your age, where you go, um, what your interests are, what mobile devices you have, and I can use that to inform how I manage that landscape. Where well, this is the South Downs National Park, you can see Lewis sticking out like a sore thumb, and a number, number of other hot, other hotspots. So this is a this is a single day in the South Downs National Park. They had one over one million visitors, um, majority of which were residents, uh, workers. Uh, oh no, majority of which were visitors, and we had residents and workers. Um, and we're working with. Uh, with Telefonica and City Logic to, to develop this. And this looks at a historic canal. The map on the right there looks at historic canals in Wales. Happy to talk to people more about this if anyone's interested, but we're running low on time, so I'll move on. 
this just re reflects what Rebecca was saying. We, I'm sure this is teaching people how to suck eggs, and we all are coming from the same uh, song sheet. But it's, it shouldn't be a top-down approach to managing these these landscapes, managing the heritage. It should be what we saw with Bob um, this morning, and a circular approach to managing uh, managing our heritage in these protected landscapes. Um, and it's just about working together and collaboration. Um, we making the use of what's available in your surrounding area. We currently have a scheme called the Green Halo, which uh, looks at bringing together professionals, academics, universities, um, other institutions to improve the surroundings. And that's that doesn't have to be right next to the national park. It can be all the way out to other landscapes as well. Um, and. Just an example here of how uh, we've worked with Bournemouth University to identify prehistoric sites and record new students as well to um, record sites and whatnot. But um, as I say, it's, it, it's a fantastic resource, it's a fantastic approach. I think we could talk about it for ages, but I think we've run out of time, unfortunately. Out of time. So thank you very much for listening. Everyone.